Welcome to Dove Point Bible Study. We're so glad you joined us. And today we're in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, the final chapter in this great book, written by the Apostle Paul. And Paul was of the tribe of Benjamin, <clears throat> of the house of Israel, and he was a Jew of Jews. But after his conversion to Christianity, Paul wrote this book of Hebrews to address his own people, the Jewish people, using Old Testament scriptures which they knew to prove that Jesus Christ was in fact the true Messiah of God. And he did that and he got in a lot of trouble for it. And you'll see that in a moment. <clears throat> which is why there is so much comparison in this book between the earthly tabernacle and the heavenly tabernacle. Also the comparison between <clears throat> the uh, earthly priesthood and the heavenly priesthood of Jesus Christ. Teaching the Jewish people that Christ fits and fulfills all the Old Testament requirements to be the Messiah of God. And from the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verse 11 through 17, Paul tells us that the gospel he preached was not taught to him by men, but that he received it by revelation of Jesus Christ Himself. And this book is not only enlightening to the Hebrew people, but it is also good for the New Testament Christian believers because in many ways the book of Hebrews is the roots of the New Testament. It celebrates Christ as the fulfillment of the Old Testament Judaism. And I love this book because this book will help Christians to understand his or her Hebrew roots. And it is a vital thing to understand. And after having summarized the vast changes brought about by the coming of Christ to His Jewish brothers and sisters, the book's final chapter begins with a clear statement about one thing that is not changed. And that one thing is love. The love among believers. So with all that in mind, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, and it reads, Let brotherly love continue, comma, not a period. Verse 2, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now, please notice, these first two verses is only one sentence. And he's saying, when it comes to brotherly love and the angels, do not be forgetful. In other words, you need to be real careful right here. He'll tell you why. And what is the word for brotherly love? What's the word? It's Philadelphia. All right. Remember, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And it's like the church of Philadelphia in Revelations chapter 3. The church of brotherly love. And what did the church of Philadelphia have in common with the church of Smyrna? The only two churches that pleased Christ. What did they have in common? <clears throat> Do you remember? They knew those who claim to be of our brother Judah and do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. That's the two things Jesus said that they had in common. So we have some false angels coming. And anytime you entertain strangers, you want to be very careful with what they are saying and does it align with God's Word. You'll see that in a minute. In this church of brotherly love, okay, and in it, gives, it gives you a key, all right? And it's called the key of David. And the key of David is the wisdom of Almighty God that unlocks doors that no man can open, or that no man can close, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and it also locks and closes up doors that no one can open. In other words, think about it. When you have this key. You cannot be deceived because you know the truth of God's Word. You know the difference between a truth and a lie. And currently, we, have a gener uh, we live in a generation where that becomes of the utmost importance. Especially when you watch the news. You can really see it. <clears throat> that you be careful, okay? Who you entertain as to who they are where they came from, and what they believe. 
And if it doesn't line up with God's Word, then you what? Then you react accordingly. Okay? <clears throat> so verse 1 says, Let the brotherly love continue, but be not forgetful that Satan and his angels are going to get shaken out of heaven, Revelation 12, 6 and 7, onto the earth, and they're going to be looking for people to what? To deceive. This is why I'm bringing this up. Okay? So make sure that you're not one of those persons. In 2 Corinthians 11.13, Paul continues on with this subject, and Paul calls these fallen angels that are coming false apostles and deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And they're coming. All right? And then, listen, if you're not already schooled in the Word when they get here, uh, you're fresh meat for them. I'm just telling you right now. Now, <clears throat> I know, okay, I know what some of you are thinking. I think. Maybe I don't. I know, <clears throat> all right, <clears throat> that God has His good angels out here helping also. There's no question about it. But, we are very close to the heavens being shaken. So what I'm telling you as a teacher, be careful and be aware. Because there's some folks coming that can really teach and can really preach. And if you don't know the difference, when these people get here, when these beings get here, woo, if you don't know your stuff, they'll have you in their hand. Okay? Verse 3, Remember them that are in bonds. They're in, they're in jail. Okay, As bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. In other words, these folks were in jail not for crimes, okay, but for teaching God's Word. That's why they were in the clink. All right? They were jailed for being Christians in that early church. But you know what? It still goes on today in certain countries. Now, that used to be what you heard out of foreign countries only, if you're an American. But now this kind of persecution has come to our own nation. Whenever the FBI designates and labels Christians right here in our own country as terrorists for speaking what they believe, and that has went on, then no, friend, it's, it's already started. It's already started. And it's here. Now, we let that slip in as Christians. We, we fell asleep at the wheel and we let that slip in. But it's time to get rid of it. And we're coming up on a season where we have an opportunity to do this. Verse 4, <clears throat> Marriage is honorable, Paul says, in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. I mean, that's pretty heavy stuff. All right? Question. I got another question. When Christ returns, what and I taught this last tabernacle service. When Christ returns, all right, what's going to be the first thing that takes place after he's landed and defeated the enemy? What's the first thing that takes place? A marriage. And spiritually speaking, if you're already married up with a false messiah, you're going to be in big trouble on that day because you won't have a wedding garment. You'll be put to the back of the line and uh, you've got about a thousand years of hard school to go through and then you'll get another opportunity to see if you make that second wedding right before the second resurrection. And this marriage with the true Christ is honorable above all. So wait, be patient, and stay true <coughs> For the true one, okay? And I know if somebody just tuned in and they've never been taught, they'd think, what in the world is he talking about? But the people who watch this <clears throat> YouTube channel, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you need to be teaching it, okay? We're to spread this word of the truth. Verse 5, let your communication be without covetousness, all right? And be content with such things as you have. For He said, I will never leave thee <clears throat> nor forsake thee. It's a powerful statement. In other words, do not let the craving for earthly possessions eat you alive. It ain't worth it. 
and be happy with what your present circumstances are and with what you have right now. You can always change that with faith and with works. But right now, if you're there, <clears throat> be pleased with it for now. Make plans to move up? Yes, but be pleased with it for now. For God will not, here's why, for God will not in any way <clears throat> fail you, nor will, <clears throat> excuse me, He give you up and leave you without support. I don't care what level you're living on. He will not do that. And that's what Paul is saying. And be happy when God gifts someone else. Be happy. Because they've earned it or they wouldn't have it. Okay? If they're Christians, they wouldn't have it if they didn't earn it. So be happy. <clears throat> Verse 6. So that we may boldly say. Here's why you want to be content where you're at for right now. So that we can boldly say, <clears throat> the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall try to do unto me. That's powerful. And you won't have to. And all the promises in the Bible are yours. If, here, here's that two letter word, if <clears throat> you have faith, and if you believe, and if you ask, seek, knock, and believe, Jesus said, I will open that door. Now, I get letters from people from all over the place who live alone, okay? And I understand this. And the truth is, and they know this too, we're never alone, really, not really. For He will never leave us, nor will He ever forsake us. He just told us that. Papa is always there, ladies and gentlemen. He's always there. <clears throat> and I talk to Him all the time. And you know what? I hope you do too, because it makes his day when you talk to him. Verse 7, Remember them, Paul says, that have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the Word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Now, don't read this wrong, okay? You do not follow the man. You follow God. Amen. And if the man is teaching God's Word, fantastic, great, you're in a good spot. And if he's not teaching God's Word, then get away from him or her. Okay? Why? <clears throat> because of what verse 8 is getting ready to tell you. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Hey, no surprises with Jesus. Okay, nothing coming from the backside that you don't see. The world ages are going to change, but the words of Christ will never change. Not from the first earth age, this one, or the one to come. It won't change. Because God's Word is just that way. Because God's Word is the same yesterday, it's the same today, <clears throat> and it'll be the same tomorrow. That's why you can count on it. Okay? His Word is the anchor of your soul. That's the truth. Verse 9, Be not carried away <clears throat> with divers, or that is, different and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing <clears throat> that the heart be established with grace, with love, with, with love and grace, not with meats, which have not profited them, <clears throat> that have been occupied therein. In other words, God's health laws are a wonderful thing when you follow them. They really are. But never lose sight of our war with Satan and the stand that God expects us to take against him. Our Father's doctrines are not strange and they are not different. They are all important. Some of them are good for your health and some of them are good for giving you eternal life. So, Paul's advice here, <laughs> seek after eternal life <clears throat> first and foremost. Then you can go back and pick up the health laws. Okay? Seek that eternal life right up front. <clears throat> Let's take a Lachim break, shall we? <clears throat> Lachim to life. I'm putting it in this dry desert right now. <laughs>
Dry desert of <clears throat> my mouth. Verse 10. Now listen to this close. We have an altar. I wonder where it's at. Whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. In other words, we have an altar. What is it? It's the cross. That's our altar. Where Christ was crucified. Verse 11. <clears throat> For the bodies of those beasts from the Old Covenant whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned, get this, they're burned without the camp. God didn't want that mess inside the camp. He wanted the blood. Take the rest of that animal and, and burn it outside the camp. <clears throat> he don't want that mess. Verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people with His own blood, suffered where? <clears throat> without the gate. Without, without, outside of the city. In other words, he was marched up to Golgotha, up the Via Della Rosa, the, rose of su the road of suffering. And Golgotha means a place of the skull. And the word is cranium in the Greek. All right? In the English, the same word is called Calvary. And it's not about a horse and an army. Calvary means the same thing. It means place of the skull. That's what it means. And he was crucified outside the city, fulfilling even this prophecy, and at the same time, what else did He fulfill? He fulfilled the law of God. That's what He fulfilled. Verse 13, Let us go forth therefore unto Him, where does it say to go? Without the camp. Doing what? Bearing His reproach. In other words, sometimes, <clears throat> because we're commissioned to do it, we go outside the camp, so to speak meaning into the world where what exists, where false doctrines exist and false teachings are prevalent. And there you let it be known that you stand for the Word of God even at the point of being shamed and despised. That's what it means to be reproached. Okay, So who cares? So they put you down because <clears throat> you believe the Word of God and not their tradition? Who cares? It's, 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 it's bad luck on their end, not ours. 14. For here, meaning here on this planet, right now in the flesh, <clears throat> we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. That indeed we do. In other words, our political system is coming, okay? And we know there are better things ahead. And there is a kingdom coming with Almighty God at the head, <clears throat> through the Son. Verse 15. By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifices of praise to God. Once in a while? Is that what it says? No. It says continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Glory to God. And I cannot <clears throat> begin to tell you how much our Father loves to hear the words Father, I love you. You know what that does? It makes Him happy. It pleases our Father. <clears throat> if you don't take the time, you should. And every day, I start my day off by saying, thank you, Father, for giving me a life. I didn't even exist before He spoke my life into existence. It's the same thing for you. I mean, you can <clears throat> not have a whole lot of things in the natural. But if you're alive, woo, you got the main thing. You got a life. So I thank you, Father, for giving me a life and good health and a beautiful family. Never has a man been more blessed than me. I love you, Father. Now lead me and guide me through this day so that it is pleasing to you. And that's really how I feel. And God knows my heart. Verse 16, But to do good <clears throat> and to communicate, forget not. Don't forget to communicate with one another. For such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Okay? We talked about a root of bitterness. Not letting it take root. I think it was in the last lecture. This is kind of the same thing. Communication is very important, especially when it comes to your family. And many times when a family's having trouble, it's 
Most of the time, it's because they're not communicating. Okay? One is always, an ima is always imagining what the other ones are thinking. Yeah, I know what they're thinking. Well, <clears throat> and most of the time, it's not right. All right? And then if you get someone in the middle, another family member really likes to stir it up with a stick. Oh, yeah, make it stink real bad. Then it what? It gets worse. And the people get farther and farther apart. And it gets harder and harder to make reconciliation. Because, like they said in Cool Hand Luke, what we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> so we don't need to do that, right? Remember that movie. That's what it was said. <clears throat> so instead of imagining what folks are thinking, just talk things out. That's all you got to do. And say how you feel. That's okay. That's what it's about. Say how you feel. They say how they feel. That's cool. If the other person doesn't receive it, well, at least you tried to do the right thing. Okay? And I'm going to tell you what the last straw is. And in case like that, and they just don't come around, you just might need to move on. I'm just telling you how it is. It's better than friction. Verse 17. Obey them. Here we go again. Don't misunderstand this. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. Now, <clears throat> if you have a good teacher, he or she is going to teach you to submit to God and to Christ, not to him or her. And if he doesn't teach you to submit to God and His Word, <laughs> well, you know what? He'll have to answer for that or she'll have to answer for that. And you probably ought to just move on. Verse 18. <clears throat> Pray for us, Paul said, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. You know, and that's where most of us live. We try to we mess up occasionally, and we have to go back and, and uh, we have to get repentance, and we have to go back and apologize at times. But that's okay. That's how we hang together, and that's the way we want to have it. We don't want it any other. Way And Paul never hesitates to say, I love this about Paul. He said, pray for me. I'll ask you, our Dove Point audience, I'll ask you to pray for me. I can use it. I feel it when prayers come my way. And I need them. <clears throat> Verse 19, <clears throat> But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you sooner. In other words, Paul is saying, I especially need your prayers right now so that I can come back to you sooner. He's writing to them, but he wants to come and see him face to face. Verse 20, Now the God of peace that brought again <clears throat> from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd through the blood of the everlasting covenant. And that, and that covenant is eternal life. And that's what the covenant is good for. And that's what you gain by following the Good Shepherd. And you know who the Good Shepherd is. It's Jesus Christ, of course. And remember, He is the one. Think about this. We're to emulate Him. He is the one who left the 99 to go and find the one that was lost. It's very important for us to emulate and imitate. 21. <clears throat> Make you perfect. Oh, listen to this. This is a good one. Paul was so brilliant. Make you perfect in every good work <clears throat> to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight <clears throat> through Jesus Christ to who be glory forever. Amen and amen. Now, this word perfect in the Greek means it don't mean you're going to be perfect and have no flaws. It doesn't mean that. It means <clears throat> to it, it means to complete thoroughly every good work and assignment that God has ordained that you do with your life. That's what it means. You do that when you go to your work. Everybody in this room does that when they go to their... Listen to this. Because you not only go to work, you also have a call. Let me read it again. 
make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And it means to complete thoroughly every good work and assignment that God has ordained that you do with your life. Complete and finish His work. And you know what's going to happen? God's going to be pleased. He's going to be pleased. Whatever it is that He's called you to do, whatever it is He's asked you to do. And it doesn't matter. <clears throat> Let's just take a church for example. It doesn't matter if you're the person is the, who is the door person. Okay? And you open and close the door for people that come into the church. You know, that person gets the same reward that the pastor gets if their hearts are pure. There's no reward over the other person. Some of them have a lot more responsibility, but hey, whatever your duty is, do it with all your might and do it completely, Paul said. I think that's a fantastic verse. 22, <clears throat> And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter to you in few words. He's talking about this letter of Hebrews. Paul is telling his Jewish brothers and sisters to listen closely to his letter because it is a very short letter. Okay? And you might miss some things. And then, once you study this letter, then hold one another up and encourage one another in your fellowship. Verse 23, Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom if he come, come shortly, I will see him. In other words, Timothy has been released from prison for, you guessed it, being a witness for Christ. And if he comes here soon, Paul says, I will see you along with him when he comes. And that's what he's talking about here. Verse 24, Salute all them that have rule over you and all saints. They of Italy salute you. <laughs> so he's in, he's in Italy. I mean, you know, he's up there by Rome, so the guy got around. You'll see that in a minute, how much he did get around. Verse 25, to finish the book. <clears throat> and I hope you've really enjoyed this book as we've went through it. You know, we do one lecture a week, and I, I covered all 13 chapters and 12 lectures. Where else can you go and spend roughly 50 minutes a week and in 12 lessons, you have completely consumed the whole entire book of Hebrews or whatever book we're teaching with understanding. That's what He called us to do. And the crew here, that's what we're all called to do. But it's a fabulous thing that God, that God lets us do that. And Paul says, grace be with you all. Amen. Amen. And I say the same thing to all those listeners at Dove Point. Grace be with you all. Amen. So be it. Hallelujah. That completes our study of this great book of Hebrews. <clears throat> and I really do hope you enjoyed it. I know it was real teachy, but I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed not only bringing it to you, but studying it again. You know, every time you study the Word, chances are you're going to see, oh, I didn't see that the last time I was in here. Yeah, you know why? Because that well's really, really deep. <laughs> and the more you get in it, the deeper it goes. And now I told you last week <clears throat> that I would finish this lecture up with a tribute to one of my heroes, Paul the Apostle. And so now I could do a whole lecture on it, <clears throat> but I decided to just tag this one because this one was a short lesson. <clears throat> I'd like to pray, uh, pay this brief tribute to this most amazing, brilliant scholar and man, Paul the Apostle, who was born to Jewish parents, and his father was of the tribe of Benjamin, and was also a Pharisee, as was Paul. Paul was a Pharisee. Okay? So you know how far he had to come from, if you know what a Pharisee is, how far this man had to come from to get to where he got to. <clears throat> you can read that. You can document what I just told you in Acts 23, verse 6. And Paul was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, a Gentile city. Think about that. 
but he was brought up in Jerusalem. His family sent him to Jerusalem for the sake of what? Education. His dad's a Pharisee. He wants Junior to be a Pharisee. And Saul was his name then, learned at the feet of Gamaliel, a Pharisee and a celebrated doctor of the Jewish law, the most celebrated one of that time, who also, by the way, had great common sense. Okay? He's the one when the Sanhedrin wanted to destroy Christ. He said, you know what? You guys need to back off on this and let this play out. You guys may be wrong. Okay, well, they didn't back off. <clears throat> but he saw something there. <clears throat> okay? And Paul grew up, <clears throat> because of all this, to be an overzealous Hebrew of Hebrews. I mean, he was on it. His given name, of course, I said it a while ago, is Saul who after his conversion was changed to Paul, which means small, <laughs> for he was small in stature. So it wasn't a derogatory, a derogatory term. It was just <clears throat> pointing out the guy. <clears throat> He's the small guy over there, you know. <clears throat> so anyway, that's how that came about. Now, according <clears throat> excuse me, to Acts 6.13 and Acts 7.58, Saul, or Paul, is the young man at whose feet the false witnesses who stoned Christ's disciple Stephen to death laid their outer garments at. They laid their outer garments after they killed Stephen at the feet of Paul. You see, Paul approved of the murder of Stephen and because of his misdirected zeal. You think about that. There's people in Christianity that have mis <laughs> misdirected zeal. I, I hate to say it, but it's the truth. But Paul had a misdirected zeal for tradition, his Jewish tradition. And what did he do? Well, you do what any good Pharisee does. Began a campaign of vicious persecution against Christ's followers. That's where he went. Natural for him seemed okay. You know what I'm saying? So, <clears throat> it, it gets even worse than that. I'll tell you how pumped up he was. He went to the high priest <laughs> and even procured from him written authorization from the high priest himself to search out and punish disciples of Christ as far north as Damascus in Syria. Now, that's a long ways from Jerusalem. <clears throat> you can find that in Acts 9. 3 verses 19. And as Paul neared Damascus, you know what happened. Suddenly, Acts 9, 3 through, uh, 9, 3 through 19, <clears throat> there shined round about him a bright, and a bright light from heaven. <laughs> and it was, it was the Shekinah light of glory. It's the Shekinah glory of God. And it hit him so hard. He fell to the earth. Talking about falling out under the power. He got knocked off his horse, okay, and I'm being kind, onto his other thing. Now that's bad enough. The next thing he hears a voice, huh? <laughs> and heard a voice saying unto him, knew him personally, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Whew. Now I'd be shook at that point myself. <laughs> and he said, here he was smart. Here he said, Who are you, Lord? That was smart. And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, who you persecute. And Paul, trembling and astounding, said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Get up and go into Damascus, and it shall be told you what you must do. There was his first assignment, obey the voice of Jesus. <clears throat> and the men traveling with Paul stood speechless, hearing a voice, but they didn't see any man. Paul alone understood the words. They heard a voice. They didn't understand the words either. Paul alone understood the words and was blinded. Okay, And he had to be led by the hand to Damascus. Talk about a humbling moment. He's having one right here. And for three days, 
Three is the number of completion. Okay? When things happen in threes in your life, just start looking out. Something's already completed. Okay? You have a dream two times, and I need to teach on dreams and visions. I will soon. <clears throat> but you have a dream or a vision two times, I can prove it to you from the Word. What you saw is not here yet, but it's close. When you have one three times the number of completion, it's already here. <laughs> oh, me and, one of, and my best friend right here that tapes me, I'll tell you right now, we've talked for years back and forth over the phone and in person about dreams that we've had and we pay attention to how many times and this and that and we've worked through these things together for 30 years and they always prove to be come out exactly what God said. They always prove to come out that way. So it's a powerful thing if God sends you a vision or if He sends you a dream. For three days, He neither ate nor drank. What does that tell you? <laughs> he was humbled. He didn't get hungry through that three days because He was still worrying about what happened on the road. That means He was serious. Then Paul, because if he said after two days he's eating and drinking like a, you know, a thirsty donkey, that ain't going to get it. Then Paul saw in a vision Christ's disciple Ananias come in and restore his sight. And when the vision became a reality, it did, Paul was baptized, received the Holy Spirit, partook of food, and gained strength. But he didn't do it till after that. And verse 19 says, then was Saul... You've got to listen to this carefully from here on out. Okay? Because you're not going to hear this taught. Alright? But I'm going to teach it. Verse, because this is always... I've always been intrigued with this and I've always had questions about it and God answered my questions. And <clears throat> Verse 19 says, Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Okay? Now, I <clears throat> lightheartedly call it Damascus because <laughs> of what happened to him, but that's me. <laughs> so, and what happens next? After he gets, you know, gets his eyesight there in Damascus, what happens next has always been what intrigued me because I never heard anybody teach it. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, he speaks of his going off into Arabia after his conversion, and then of his returning back to Damascus later. I'll read it to you. And Galatians 1.18 tells us <clears throat> this whole process took three years of his life. And then after that, he would go to Jerusalem and not until. You got it? I'll read it right from the book for you in a minute. Question. Okay? Think with me for a minute. Because this bugged me forever. Okay? After Paul's life-altering revelation of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, at what point, here comes the question, at what point did God just, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, at that point, here's the question, did God just instantly download the full understanding of how Christ fulfilled all of the Old Testament and its prophecies into Paul's mind and his spirit, bam, right there? Well, because there's nothing impossible to God, I suppose he could have. But I personally do not think he did. Because Paul said in Galatians 1, 17 and 18, after my conversion... I did not go to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia. Okay? Now, you're inside my mind here, okay? This is where this is coming from. There had to be a reason why he goes to Arabia. Am I right? Does that make sense? I mean, you just don't say, okay... I'm saved now. I got this big call. I'm going to go down in, in a desert just hang out. <laughs> that ain't what he did. <clears throat> so, here's the question. Another question. Why did he go to Arabia? I think it was to meditate on God's will for the rest of his life. 
I got to find out what I'm supposed to do. And he was going to get that information, get this, we'll read it in a minute, directly from Jesus Christ Himself. And to get that full understanding would take some time as He struggles between the law and grace. It had to. And like with us, there is a disciple process. Okay? And according to the Scripture, he went about two years, he, he, he spent two years in Arabia. Next question. What's in Arabia? Think with me. Out there in, in, in YouTube land, think with me. What is in Arabia? What is the one big thing that you think he might want to go see in Arabia? In a desolate desert. Think about it. You got the answer? How about Mount Sinai? How about Mount Sinai? So did Paul go to Mount Sinai? Well, the Bible does not tell us if he did or he didn't. Though some believe that he did in exactly the same way that Elijah went to Mount Sinai years before to seek the Lord and to seek refuge when he was running for his life from Jezebel. Paul kind of had a similar thing going here. Okay? <laughs> the Christians were scared to death of him, or that he knew that they would be, okay? And the Jews would be after him to kill him because they think he's trying to stamp out their religion. You know, oh, Elijah had a problem too. And in a cave on Mount Horeb. Now, if you check it out, Mount Horeb in your Bible is the same as Mount Sinai. It's interchangeable. In a cave on Mount Sinai is where Elijah heard the still small voice of God, and you can find that in 1 Kings chapter 19, 8 and 9. So whether or not Paul went to Mount Sinai, I don't know. Okay? But I do know he went to Arabia because he said he did. And I believe it was in Arabia that the Lord Himself instructed Paul, and that is where Paul received in the fullness the Lord's Gospel receiving the revelation of salvation by grace through faith. And he didn't reject the Torah. No, no, no. This is the marriage covenant. But he understood it properly now in its evangelical place. And ladies and gentlemen, that Bible's a thick book, and I'm sure it took some time to get there. Just listen to Paul's own words about what happened after his conversion in his letter to the Galatians. You can read it with me if you want. It's Galatians 1, chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. See, it's a, when you get to the epistles, it's girls eat popcorn continually. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. <laughs> okay, Colossians. There you go. <clears throat> Here's the words of Paul after his conversion. Galatians 1, verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel that was preached of me is not after man. In other words, I didn't learn it from a man. What I know, and buddy, he knew a bunch. Verse 12. For neither received I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it by man, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. He met him on the road to Damascus, and he's meeting him here too. And they're conversing. Same thing that happened to John on the Isle of Patmos. He had a revelation of Jesus Christ, wrote the whole book. Fifth, look at verse 15. But when it pleased God, Paul said, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace, look at 16, to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen, Immediately, watch this, immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. I didn't run to the church. Well, what do I do with this? What am I going to do? What else should I believe? What church should I go to? He didn't do that. He said, immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. He went right straight to God. 17, neither, watch this, and he knew those guys were in Jerusalem, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, 
But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. And that was the whole three-year trip, round trip. Verse 18, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. Verse 19, But other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. That'd be pretty cool. And because Paul was such an Old Testament scholar, when Jesus began to reveal Himself through what all the prophets had spoken of Him, the download of who Christ is in the Old Testament Scriptures became glaringly clear to Paul, and he had no doubt that Jesus Christ is in fact the real Messiah. And I contend that it happened in Arabia. Because that's where he said he went. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine the download process he was going through for that two years? Thumbing through, you know, well, a virgin shall be born. Where is he going to be born? Bethlehem. Yeah, Jesus was born there. And he's just going through all these scriptures. He gets over to Zechariah and he finds out, oh my, there's two advents. He said he'd come once, but he's going to come again. Then it made sense. He just kept... I can just see how he's downloading it and he's making sense of the whole thing. And buddy, when he came out of that Arabia, he was fired up and he was ready to go because he had the information. And when Paul returned to Damascus, after his time in Arabia, Acts 9 says, Paul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews, watch this, which dwelt at Damascus, proving, proving that Jesus Christ is the true Messiah. And they couldn't take it. They couldn't take it. So what happened? The Jews took counsel to kill him. That's the answer. You know, kind of reminds me of Trump. You know, he, he comes up with an answer and all they can do is just, let's take him out. Let's don't give him a chance. Let's just take him out. That's not the way you do things. And they took counsel to kill Paul. Then the disciples, and everybody knows this, you've read this. Then the disciples took him by night, and Acts 9, and led him down by the wall in a basket to save his life. And that's when Paul went to Jerusalem and spent 15 days with Peter. Now, think about this. Here's Peter, that old fisherman who walked with Christ. And here's Paul who's just had a two years of straight revelation. At least in my opinion, that's what happened. Okay? And they're sitting down and they're comparing notes and they're having a conversation for the very first time. Wouldn't you have loved to have heard that conversation as these two great men in the Gospels put two and two together? Oh, yeah, that's right. And you remember when he did Yeah, and you remember when he did that? Well, man, what? 15 days right there. They probably went through the Bible 15 times. I don't know. But I would have loved to have heard that conversation. But you know what they did do? They agreed on everything. Because Peter had been with Jesus and got it firsthand, and so did Paul. And so there was no discrepancy. Okay? And while he was in Jerusalem, Paul was still in there 15 days, he decided, well, I'm going to go down to the temple and pray. You know, that's what, that's what you do. And so he went down there to pray and had a vision. Uh oh. Dun, dun, dun. Jesus shows up again in a vision. But it's Jesus. And he saw Jesus. And Jesus told Paul, you need to get out of Jerusalem and you need to do it quickly. For they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Now if you want to read that word for word, go to Acts 22 verses 18 through 21 where Paul is going over his conversion and where he went after that and what happened. So it's the same thing. Depart at once, Jesus said. For I, get this, it's in Acts 22, For I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So Paul returned to his early home in Tarsus. You know, he got the you-know-what out of Jerusalem. He got out of Dodge. And what did he do? He sailed back to where he was born. Way up north. Went up the, sailed up the Mediterranean and went back to Tarsus. And from Tarsus... He travels to Antioch, which is a little bit west and a little bit south, maybe 150 miles, 100 miles. 
Antioch. There was a great Christian church rocking and rolling in Antioch at the time. And Paul preaches in this great church at Antioch when he goes by, first time in there. <clears throat> and it was right there that the Holy Spirit fell on a prophet and they ordained Paul and Barnabas as foreign missionaries and their work began. They left Antioch and their work began on the island of Cyprus and from there they went to pretty much all of Asia Minor. It is estimated, my friend, that they covered 1,500 miles and their mission lasted about two years. This guy's made out of steel. Then, the second missionary journey from Antioch was with Silas, because they always end up back at the mother church at Antioch. They go to Jerusalem, they get killed, so they made Antioch their headquarters. And they revisited the church in the second missionary journey with Silas. They revisited the churches in Asia Minor, and then they were called in a vision from God into where? Into Britain. Into Eng I'm sorry, into Europe where they got as far as Great Britain. I've read all the books on it. Absolutely proofed that he made it as far as Great Britain. Where they established even more churches, and they suffered a lot of persecution on that trip. This trip, estimated to be about three years, having traveled 3,500 miles. Now, two-thirds of this is by ship, because those trade routes ran all along those coasts. Okay? So it wasn't all walking. It was mostly ship, but there was a lot of walking involved. The third missionary journey, leaving again the home church in Antioch, he revisited the churches in Galatia, Phygia, Ephesus, and then on to Macedonia and Greece, and then back to Jerusalem, about 4,000 miles in all. And while he was in Jerusalem, he found himself the object, <laughs> oh boy, of intense hatred, again, and a conspiring a, a, and they, a conspiracy against his life was formed in Jerusalem by the Jewish people, and he was their leaders, the Pharisees, and he was arrested under false charges. But at that time, the Romans rescued him from the mob because Paul's father was not only a Pharisee, he was also a Roman soldier. I mean, a Roman citizen. So that made him a Roman citizen, and that's what got him off the hook. There, I'm almost done. Then Paul was taken to Caesarea and was a prisoner for two years there where he appeared before Felix, not the cat, Festus, not Hagen, okay, and King Agrippa. All three of these men presided over Judah under Nero of Rome. These were big boys. You remember old Agrippa? He said, almost thou persuadest me. He preached to these guys. But having appealed to Caesar, that's what he did, he was sent to Rome where he was chained to a soldier, and that was another two years. And he preached to Caesar's household and others who came to him. So God put him right up in the height. Put him in Caesar's household. Put him in front of all these guys. And while he was confined, what did he do? He wrote epistles to the various churches that he had founded. He didn't waste any time. And Paul was finally beheaded in Rome about A.D. 67 by Nero. Fourteen of the 27 books in the New Testament are traditionally attributed to Paul. And today, Paul's epistles continue to be the vital roots of the theology, the worship, and pastoral life in the church worldwide. Paul's influence on Christ Christian thought and practice has been as profound as it is pervasive among all that of many other apostles and missionaries involved in the spread of the Christian faith. And what amazing man, this Paul the Apostle, who even before he was born, God had chosen him so that he could go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel of Christ. I, amen. And those of us who are descendants are from Europe, we got Paul to thank for Christianity that came to Europe. And there were Christians today, so I thank God for that. And Paul is one that taught both the Gentiles and the Jews in 1 Corinthians 5-7 to purge out the sin in our lives, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So Christ is our Passover. And from Exodus 23, verses 14 through 26, it tells us that Yahovah, God, desires 
a first fruits offering every year, okay, from his, from his people. And we've been doing this for over 20 years, and uh, it never fails. He asked for a first fruits offering every single year. And Israel was an ag agronomous economy, okay? So at the barley harvest, and then the wheat harvest, and then the fruit harvest, okay? He wanted a first fruits offering. Well, you know, we don't do that. Some of us might, but we, most of us have jobs or we have businesses, okay? And, and God desires a first fruits offering every year at the Feast of Passover, it's coming up in two weeks, at the Feast of Pentecost, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And for those who give a first fruits offering, God has promised seven special blessings, and they're listed right here. Maybe you've never heard them, but I'm going to quickly read them. Promise number one. God says for a first fruits offering, I will send an angel before you and keep you in the way and bring you into the place I have prepared for you. Woo-wee! If you're seeking direction right now in your life, probably the best thing you could do is lay a first fruits offering on God's altar. This promise is for you. You want to find you? I've done this for people before. That's my suggestion to them. And it works. Promise number two. If you obey my voice and do all that I speak, I will be an enemy unto your enemies. I'll take me some of that. And I'll be an adversary to all your adversaries. Anybody want some of that? Promise number three. The Lord said, I'll bless you with plenty of good food, plenty of good bread, and plenty of good water. And if you've ever had a, a well go bad, which we've, you know, I've seen this in the past, you know what a blessing good water is. Woo-wee! Promise number four. The Lord says, I will take sickness away from amongst you. Here is a first fruits offering, dad or mom, for the health of your whole family. Stand on it. Declare it. Call it done. Promise number five. There will be no miscarriages in your family. Maybe you've had them in the past. I don't know. But he said, look, make this offering and believe God. Promise six, there will be no barren wombs. Promise number seven. The Lord says, I will allow you. Oh, thank you, Lord. I want this one. I got this one. This one, mine. It's yours too if you want it. The Lord says, I will allow you to fulfill your number of days upon the earth. Why? So that you may fulfill all that God sent you here to do. Mm -mm -mm. We've been doing this for years here at Dove Point. I can tell you, these people that are in here tonight, they can tell you, God will keep His promises. He will do it. Seven fantastic promises for a first fruits offering. You know? Well, I went to church half my life. Right? You know, traditional church. We got offering every week. Three times a week. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? God's asking for three of them, okay? I like God's deal. So, ask the Lord, okay, where He, where he would have you give your first fruits offering. And I'm not telling you it has to be in a fellowship or a church. Why? Because the, uh, the body of Christ is made up of living stones. It's made up of His people. When you give to one of God's people, He speaks to you to give to one of His people, you're giving it to the house of God, a piece of it. Okay? So give it where He tells you to give it, where He'll reveal it to you. And the amount of the offering, I like this too, is strictly up to the person. You decide how much you want to give. Base it yourself. And don't forget our Spring Fellowship and Passover service on Sunday, April 21st, Year of Our Lord, 2024. It'll be held at the Mining Days Building, 703 Dawson Drive, King Jack Park, Webb City, Missouri, 64870. 10 a.m. fellowship, refreshments will be provided. 11 a.m., I will bring a Passover lecture. Following the lecture, there will be a communion service. After communion, there will be a prayer line for all those who want prayer. And we will be anointing with oil and laying hands on the sick, bring the sick. So if you need a touch in your body or mind, come expecting that something good is going to happen to you. And you know what? If you do, that's your faith. It's going to happen. And I can tell you from everybody in this studio tonight, we hope to see you there. 
Some of them come from long distance, but we, we love them all from here locally or whatever. So, and here, and, don't, and listen, don't miss this. Do not miss the next lecture, okay? This one precedes my Passover lecture, but it kind of goes, it don't kind of, it does go with it. <clears throat> For it will be a reminder that the Lord's Passover is all about deliverance from sin, sickness, and death. And I will be bringing you a lecture entitled, Eight Bible Methods Whereby uh, You May, Whereby Healing May Be in, Obtained. I'm going to say it again. Eight Bible Scriptural Methods Whereby Healing May Be Obtained. And the reason there are different methods of healing in the Bible is because everybody's faith is not on the same level. If we cannot rise to meet Him on His level, He will come down to meet us on ours. God will not leave us stranded. He wants to see everyone healed. Also, if you would like our study notes on this entire book of Hebrews, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of them in that pack, okay? Uh, they're free for the asking. Just send your request to that little old address right there. You'll get, I, 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 made, I put my comments, condensed comments, into every single verse of that book and scriptural, other scriptural references. So if you want to teach a Bible class, you want to teach this in your church, you want to just use it to, for a reminder six months from now of what's in that book, these are perfect for that. And hit that subscribe button and hit like for us. Won't you do that? And tell a friend about us. Tell a friend about Dove Point. We'd love to meet them too. So, from all of us here at Dove Point, to all of you, we thank you for watching. Until next time, my friends, shalom and shalom.